Uh, greetings, everyone. It's a real pleasure to introduce this panel. The focus of the conference, of course, of City Lab has been the present and even more the future. We've talked about the effects of technology and sustainability and the changing uh, models of governance and about civic engagement. The purpose of this panel will be talked about the ways we incorporate the past, the public version of the past that affects cities' identities, nations' identities, especially when we're talking about difficult moments of the past. All societies have their challenging moments. The question of how to recognize and incorporate them is the one that we're going to be dealing with. And, and our purpose at the end of the session will be to give guidance to mayors, to civic leaders, to artists, to other people trying to shape the usable past about lessons from around the world and the ways in which this has worked successfully and less successfully and how you can apply these lessons in your own cities. So to do this, we have an outstanding panel of practitioners, of artists, of uh, entrepreneurs of art to give us uh, their, their, their experience. And you've heard the backgrounds of Kate Levin, whom you all know from Bloomberg. She was the commissioner of uh, of Department of Cultural Affairs in New York for more, more than a decade and now supervises arts programs for the Bloomberg's philo uh, philo philanthropies. Next to me is Esther Shalov Gertz, who is an internationally known public artist based in Paris, but doing works across Europe and now in North America as well. And Tor Einar Fageland, a professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, who's been centrally involved in these major efforts in Norway to deal with its, uh, some of its, its commemorating its uh, public history. I'm going to start now with, with Kate Levin. I'm going to ask her to talk about some of the projects she has been involved in in New York. And what has she going to tell about, about two of them in particular? And so, Kate, I turn the stage over to Kate to tell you, uh, show you some images and the lessons to be learned from these uh, great public art works in New York. Thanks Kate? so much, yes. Jim. Um, if I could have the first image up on the, the screen. Uh, memorials are part of the continuum of any kind of incursion into the public realm, but you know, they are particularly fraught and they carry so much civic aspiration with them. So you know, the, the attention to the specificity of circumstance makes each of these kinds of projects unique, but I do think there are some shared inflection points, so hopefully these two examples will help surface some of them. The 9-11 memorial uh, was commissioned to commemorate the horrendous loss of life in New York City. It took 10 years to build and was uh, surrounded by all kinds of controversies, but a, a couple of things I think were key to its successful, successful completion. And at this point, over 30 million people have visited the memorial and over 8 million people have visited the museum. Uh, first was the actual selection process. A jury was created of 13 individuals of a range of backgrounds, but they were asked to select a project based on a program that had been developed over a series of months through a process led by my colleague Anita Contini that took into great uh, consideration a lot of community involvement. So not only was the project done based on a program a set of program guidelines, but there were also uh, guidelines of principle, and one of them was that the memorial would evolve over time. So uh, Im important to, I think, value the kind of input that lays the groundwork for these kind of projects, but also to acknowledge that history is a form of evolution. Another, uh, I think, particularly interesting feature of this was the question of how the names were listed around the two memorial pools that are the key features here. And that's one of the things you can see in this photograph. Enormous source of contestation well after the project outlines had been uh, selected and in fact were underway. Uh, the artist, um, Michael Arad, had wanted the names to be featured uh, randomly as part of his understanding of the random nature of the loss of life many of the family constituencies felt very differently. They wanted the names listed by uh, 
professional affiliation, by alphabet, emergency services wanted uh, various other kinds of affiliations. Uh, ultimately, what happened was that the uh, digital designer for the museum was able to come up with an algorithmic program that allowed uh, the victim family members to choose what uh, Michael Arad ended up calling meaningful adjacencies. Every single uh, family member uh, had someone on their behalf choosing what name they wanted to be end up next to. So you had a situation, for example, where family members who were on a plane uh, retained a maiden name in the case of the wife would not have been listed together had the names been alphabetical. In this case, they were able to be listed alphabetically. Husband and wife who worked for different companies ended up being listed next to each other, which wouldn't have been impossible if working groups had been the form of affiliation. So this was a case where there was a lot of pushback against a key design element, and the solution actually made it better. Uh, ultimately, throughout this process, the role of uh, Mayor Bloomberg was also key. He and Governor Pataki protected this project in terms of allowing the jury to make a selection from an open call that got over 5,000 different uh, applicants. But as with the names, a lot of controversy, a lot of heat. Mayor Bloomberg listened to all the different points of view, made a decision, and that's the way uh, the work was ultimately installed. If I could have the second image, please. Uh, different kind of project. This came out of a city percent for art commission, and I know a number of uh, cities represented here have these kind of programs where 1% of eligible capital costs of civic projects can go to acquiring a piece of art. In this case, the city of New York built a uh, traffic triangle dedicated to Harriet Tubman uh, in the northern part of Manhattan, and there was an opportunity to create a work of art uh, commemorating her. So this was a public commissioning project, and the artist Alison Czar came up with this work of art. It's called Swing Low. Her conception was to show Harriet Tubman uh, steaming forward like a locomotive, and you can see the sort of underskirt kind of looking like a cow catcher. Um, but one of the remarkable things about this piece of work is that when it was ultimately installed, the sculpture was facing south. Um, for those familiar with the history of Harriet Tubman, a uh, key figure in uh, the emanci emancipation of slaves um, from the southern part of the United States in the years leading up to the Civil War. Uh, so her trips faced north. When this piece was installed facing south, there was a huge community uproar. Over a thousand petition signatures were collected by a neighborhood activist group. Um, one of my favorite accusations as a bureaucrat, and in this case, bureaucracy is a term of art, was that this was a conspiracy to make the triangular shape of the plaza look better um, by having the, st the statue face uh, in that direction. But the artist had been very clear in her conception of Harriet Tubman's courage. It wasn't just that she went north in acts of bravery, but it was her compassion in continuing to go back. Um, at periods where she could have rested on her laurels, claimed her heroism, gone on with the rest of her life. But so the, the orientation of the work itself was fundamental to the conception of the person being commemorated. So while the 9-11 memorial was done and opened within 10 years of the actions it commemorated, this was a case where you had a historical figure uh, being re-remembered over 100 years after her passing and well over 100 years after the work for which she was known, and you had a contemporary artist who was really trying to reimagine the, the, the courage and the essential nature of this artist for a contemporary audience. And uh, you know, the community opposition has since died down, and the work is now known in part for uh, the orientation and the interpretation that that inspires. Thank you very much, Kate. So Kate was talking about memorials to America's historical sin, which was slavery and the great historical disaster for the U.S. of the 9-11 attacks. Tor Vagland has been involved in commemorating Norway's great tragedy of the 2011 massacre. So tell us more about the process of civic engagement there. Thank you, James. Um, in, on July 2000, um, 
the right in 2011, a Norwegian anti-immigrant fanatic drove into Oslo, where he placed the car bomb in front of the government center. The car uh, bomb killed eight and destroyed the government center. Uh, thereafter, he drove in an escaped car to this tiny island of Utøya, north of Oslo, where he murdered 69 young people attending the Norwegian Labour Youth Party's summer camp. Um, before 2011, we believed that uh, terror happened elsewhere and not in Norway. And six years later, we're still struggling with um, making sense of, uh, of this uh, uh, worst atrocities, actually, uh, on Norwegian soil since World War II. And if I can have another slide here, uh, please. Not this one, not this one. That one, yeah. yeah. That is one attempt to, to, uh, to deal with this uh, trauma. Uh, it's a Swedish artist, Jonas Dahlberg, who won a memorial competition in 2013. And his suggestion was on the land side facing Utøya, one should make a cut in the Norwegian landscape, just as the terrorists have made a cut into the Norwegian nation. Um, it's a powerful work of art. Um, it's a difficult project, and the process became even more difficult. And uh, so that's off the table, and I know Esther has some views on this, so I think we, we leave it there and go back to the first slide, please. No, um, that one, perfect. Uh, because at that time, uh, being uh, no, next one. Or you, or you can you can just paint a word picture while people have it in their mind. Well, <laughs> anyway, um, um, at that time, I was as a memorial scholar. I, thank you. I was invited uh, by the government to participate, and we met with um, with the families of the victims right. and the young survivors from Utøya. And we said that we cannot tell you what to do, but we can keep you company. And what you see, <laughs> what you saw, what we saw, uh, what you saw is uh, is a physical result of this companionship, because um, in uh, the government center, right next to where the bomb went off, we made this um, July 22nd center uh, that opened in 2015. Um, and if you remember what you, what you <laughs> saw, there was in front of that, uh, in the room, uh, you saw, for instance, the remains of the car that carried uh, the bomb. And uh, some weeks, thank you, some weeks um, uh, before opening, uh, it became known that we were putting these things on display, and the media went into a frenzy because what are you doing? Are you making a terrorist shrine in the government center? Um, so I remember going in and out of TV studios for days doing interviews, uh, but always side by side with the family members and the survivors, because at that time we have been working closely for more than a year, and they wanted this story to be told, and they trusted us to do it. And even today, two years later, um, Many family members uh, spend a lot of time in this uh, place. They participated in educational programs, and many actually just like to be there. And now I'm very excited asking for the next uh, slide. <laughs> and that should be the Utaya slide. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, inside this building structure, uh, you see the former cafe building at Utaya. Um, this was a difficult issue, because inside that building, 13 young people was murdered. Uh, and the labor youths felt that coming back to the island, this building had to go. And many family members disagreed strongly. What we did was to um, not tear it down, but we didn't keep it as the terrorists had left it either. There is this building structure around with 500 pillars, each for one survivor, and inside there are 69 pillars, each for one victim. And inside, um, we uh, made this um, exhibition using text messages from 
the, the massacre when the teenagers ah. was texting to their parents and mm. then getting texts back. And uh, nobody had seen these uh, text messages before, um, but we asked the families to use them and they agreed because we have this trusted relationship and they wanted these stories to be shared because they feel that um, uh, July 22nd happened, therefore it can yeah. happen again. And you know that in the, you see in, in, at 9-11 you can listen to, to these uh, answering machines, but this is 10 years later, so you have these text messages and, and they are um, they are intimate and they are uh, painful, but they are there. And uh, so this has become an important part, also allowing the labor youths to return to the island. And I'm very happy to say that there's more activity today on the island than ever before. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So we heard how in Norway, dealing with its historic trauma, civic engagement made a big difference. So um, Esther Shalev Gertz is now going to tell who's known for many uh, monuments across Europe and North America to traumatic events. Tell us how what you the lessons you have derived about civic engagement as part of your art. Yeah, what uh, what is uh, interesting the Hamburg Monument against fascism is the idea was it wasn't as the other monuments was for an event it was against something, and this was initiated by the city of Hamburg. In, uh, in the face of the mounting of the neo-fascism, this uh, late 70s, beginning of the 80s, they wanted a monument against fascism and chose our proposition to it that is a column of 12 meters, one meter by one meter, covered with lead, inviting the passerby and the people that live there to sign their name against fascism. As the surface is filled up with signatures, the whole structure is lowered into the ground and you have a new surface to write on it and during seven years this uh, this column was actually lowered into the ground as the text that invites everybody in seven languages next to it is saying that the monument cannot fight against fascism it's us that have to do it at the opening it was a havoc the people of the city hated the monument. They said it's not a roaring uh, lion. There's no name of victims, and we have to sign. What does it mean? This was inaugurated in 86. And for me as an artist, what was amazing is to see this, this big 400 people room talking, shouting, and screaming about stuff they never talked before. And this, for an artist, is an interesting uh, events, it can be scary, but it also is very cathartic like. It can move things forward. And uh, for our great, wonderful uh, luck, the Berlin Wall disappeared in 89. So suddenly, people kind of slowly understood what does it mean participating? What does it mean to take uh, a stand? and to work with, and for me as an artist, to understand how can you deal with uh, a very cruel act, and what is my art situation, is not to repeat the cruelty, is to try to take it to another place. And this is the art part, and as an artist in public space, you never do the tango alone. You have at least three more <laughs> people to do it with you. The one that commissions, the one that judges, and the, uh, and the people that have it. So this work was a, a, like a major work, but it was also, I was bathing into monuments, be it the Russian monuments. I was born in Vilnius under the Russian occupation. Grew up in Jerusalem under the Shoah and the Holocaust monuments. And the only thing I wanted is monuments to disappear. <laughs> and means like how can you do something that will be of our time? How can you sacrifice? And the word sacrifice is a very interesting thing. How can you work with this work historically and conceptually to create a new space for us to think about things that are not 
easy to think at that time in Germany there was no monuments at all. And they wanted only to talk and not to have an object because it was still so new as we heard like in Norway. They never had it. So for me this was a big challenge to deal with it and what I did more or less we sacrificed our work Right, but we gained this new space that took time to deal with. And just briefly to talk a work that was inaugurated, that I inaugurated uh, last year in um, Geneva. And it's a double clock uh, in the city of clocks. Can I have the second yes, image, next please? image, please? And this is a work I did in 2000 in Weimar. And it was Weimar, the city of German history and culture, and Buchenwald, yeah. just six kilometers apart. Yeah. And I created a house for Walter Benjamin installation in Weimar, that one of the features was this double clock where time is ticking and asking what is time, what is history, who is participating in history, how can we enlarge the whole table to include a new situation. The city of Geneva bought the clock and installed it on a house where the workers making the clocks in the beginning of the century, they refurbished the house, they put the clock there before putting it on. They wanted the clock going backwards in Geneva. Wow. And, but the people that live there today said, why? We live here, we are artists, we want to put our works. We had to talk with them quite a lot to tell them what is the procedure of putting art in public space. The house belongs to the city, the city refurbished it. And there, there was hot discussions. I, I always have it as an international artist. You have the local artists, you have to discuss it. And it's always a kind of interesting, it benefits both sides about it. Wonderful. So I'm going to invite each of our speakers to give one sentence of distilled advice from your, for your experience to the mayors and other civic leaders who are here about the right way to do public art. Kate, one sentence from you. It requires enormous patience, but the rewards are also enormous because you really are sewing together the aspirations of a city and its citizens in a really meaningful way. Great. Thank you, Tor. One sentence from you. Um, these things take time. <laughs> and if I can add one thing, the, what you can call the power of place, it's important that the 9-11 memorial is right where the footprints are and that uh, these memorial places in Norway are where it happened. And Esther, a final sentence from you. Yeah, well, I think the placement of memorials are very important. The Hamburg Monument had to go to the park. Yeah. We insisted it's in the middle of the city. So I think the people that commission are so important that they are creatively taking the challenge to make a new place and creative place as the artist does. And I think it can be interesting, maybe dangerous. Please join me in giving sincere thanks to Tor Vagelan, Kate Levin, and Esther Shalav-Gertz. Thank you so much.